Welcome back to season four of Sister Brunch, the podcast all about Black women and gender expansive people thriving in entertainment and media. Fourth season. Did you say fourth season? Yes, you did, Fanchon. That means there are over 30 amazing women thriving in film, TV, and media that you can listen to and you can learn from uh, and you can commiserate with and unify with. You can find all of our episodes at sisterbrunch.com. And as always, you can find us on Instagram at Sister Brunch Podcast. I am your host, Fanchon Cox, and today's guest is Megan Fillmore. She is a director, producer, activist by day, and also director of production at Paramount by night. <laughs> Under the banner of her newly founded production company, Hudson Fillmore, she creates scripted and unscripted content that focuses on womanist, BIPOC, and queer people. When she's not busy being a multi-hyphenate queen, you can find her volunteering with LA Compost, Color of Change, or hanging out with her nephew, Trey. And you know we're going to ask for pictures of your <laughs> nephew, Trey. <laughs> Sisters, please help me welcome Megan Fillmore. Thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to be here. My pronouns are she, her. Um, but I did like multi-hyphenate queen as well for <laughs> those pronouns. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I might take that on. I might take that on. <laughs> um, so, Megan, we always like to start off with your journey, sharing mm -hmm. how you got to this place. You can start as far back as you want, the day you were born or the day your parents were born. That might make a three hour podcast, but I don't mind because I, <laughs> I like you. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, as far back as you want to go, tell us how you got to become a filmmaker, a director, mm -hmm. and also working at Paramount? Um, my father always had two TVs, one for sports, one for movies um, or TV shows. So I would sit by my dad um, when my parents were married. And um, so they did get divorced when I was 10. But before that, um, I would sit by him and I would watch the movies. And I watched Still Magnolias um, with Sally Field and Julia Roberts, and um, when, and there's other women in there, but when um, Sally Fields was in the funeral scene and um, at the cemetery, I said, Dad, I want to be the person that helps her do that. Mm. How do I do that? And he said, he showed me the credits. Now, okay. as a little kid, I only watched the end credits because that's Who what he showed that? me. You, you, no, 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 no. But, but I was sitting next to him. And so I watched it. He's watching sports, not paying attention to me. And then I see a UPM come up. So in my mind, I thought the UPM was that person. Not that they're not, but that's what I thought. So in my mind, it was always there. So before I was 10, that little nugget was there. Then fast forward later in high school, not only was I in math and science school, I also was very good at poetry. And so I was in arty scenes and I went to an art house in Columbus, Ohio, art house theater. And that was like the boom of Steven Soderbergh, Quentin Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, all these films were just being shown. So that was another thing that was like laid in me, these independent filmmakers and what that meant. Mm -hmm. So go off to Mount Holyoke College, all women's college, and um, I get consumed with a black aesthetic of theater. And I get to meet legends. Um, I got to meet Ntozaki Shange through Robbie McCauley, who was my, my mentor. I got to meet August Wilson. I got to meet all of these people because oh she, goodness. you know, yes. And so that is how I learned how to direct actors to organize them. I was her stage manager, um, Robbie McCauley's stage oh. manager. Also oh. Susan Laurie Parks, is one of my alums. So um, I, the two times she came there while I was at Mount Holyoke, I worked with her. And so that was my foundation in this industry. And they, and they what both, and they both told me you're a producer, like hands down, that is what your skill set is. I do know how to do other things. But it was like, that's what came up in me. But that UPM was still there because that's very simple for me. And so 
um, fast forwarding, um, I leave college um, and then I go to American Repertory Theater. I'm working there and some of my friends there all moved to LA. Um, I was in New York at the time and long story short, 9-11 happened. That's a very, you know, and then um, went back to Ohio, saved some money, take care of some family. And then I came out here. Wow. And mm -hmm. and with that great alumni association of Mount Holyoke, um, back in those days, you had to call and they would mail you out a big Rolodex of women. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so I called like all 50 and two of them got together with me. Um, and two of them got together with me and one of them put me on sets. Um, yes. and, uh, -huh, immediately the other one taught me how to stay employed through what was called reality staff, but it actually is now staff me up, I believe. Okay. And so with those two avenues and other people that I talked to on the phone were also helpful. They just didn't meet with me. So, um, which was, you know, which is different. So I try to do the same today, but basically I got my first scripted experience. Um, and then I got to see what a set was when I was around 28 years old. I worked on Hanalee Culpepper's first feature that, 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 that she did. I was, I was the PA Wrangler on her set and it just, yes. you know, it just set it up for I, me. I actually I just, still have the picture. Go I ahead. I have to say, Hanalee, uh -huh. she, um, she, one of her first shorts was through the AFI directing workshop for women. And I was in that short. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. And, awesome. And by the way, we should just plug her. She, we have an episode with her. It was just as she had, I think she had finished post on directing Picard. So mm. she's the bla first black woman to direct a, a series a, a Star Trek series, the pilot for a Star Trek series. Yeah. Um, we love her. Oh my goodness. You, and and I, I just have to say, you are naming like all the mm -hmm. sister brunch bucket list, right? <laughs> like all these incredible storytellers black women storytellers, mm -hmm. black women and non-binary folks. So yes, keep, keep, keep going. So you had the Rolodex, you had this alumni support mm -hmm. um, and how did that lead to your job at Paramount? Mm -hmm. It led to my job at Paramount because um, I had the reality staff um, background, meaning the reality TV that helped yes. me get through the writer strike because um, mm -hmm. um, I was able to, with, you know, not be, well established, but stayed through the writer strike because of reality TV. I start working um, at then it was Viacom CBS. I was line producing The Hills New Beginning. So the the Hills, the people from the Hills that are now in their 30s. I was the LP of that show. And um, from my scripted background, I'm a um, UPM that's DGA eligible for movies of the week. They had an initiative to do BIPOC queer films movies of the week initiative so it made sense since i knew them i knew them they knew i was a good line producer could follow the rules and but then i had worked at a couple other networks nfl and um youtube originals they knew that i could do the network stuff so it was just a match made for me to to come in in, in that role so that's how i am making I my it. living today <laughs> Yes. Okay. Um, I want to uh, step back a little bit and define the roles. So you talked about UPM. So I want to mm -hmm. actually define UPM okay. and even producer. So when Susan Laurie Park said to you, you're a producer, we know that producer can mean many things, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in Hollywood, you could like pick up the phone once and get a producer credit, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and we know you run circles around those folks. So let's break down UPM, what it stands for, what mm -hmm. it looks like, and then also line producer, some other things that you mentioned. So let's start with UPM. UPM, a unit production manager um, is the person who, manages the production. They are the people, they're um, a person that um, the line producer, the person who um, manages the budget of the production would bring on to hire all the rest of the crew within the budget allotted. And also if it is a union film, make sure that all union rules are in place as you go forward. They typically work um, through pre-production, production, a little bit of rap. They're typically not around for the post of it, um, but they are um, sometimes not seen. <laughs> sometimes they are seen a lot depending on the production. Um, sometimes I'm the one who just strictly budget tracks. 
and make sure things are going well when it comes to the day-to-day, the call sheets, um, managing the production office, those sort of things. But there are some times that line, the line producer likes to do those duties. And then I would be the person actually interacting with department heads, talent, if there's some sort of contractual thing going on that I have to work with another producer on, meaning there's lots of different types of producers. Um, sometimes the UPM is also credited as a producer as well, because they are. They're also a member of the Directors Guild because they are considered a part of the directing team. Okay. They get, uh uh-huh, for a DGA production, you get residuals. It is a very, um, it is a very, uh, uh, respected production um, pr- position is a very respected p- position by the DGA, which a lot of people don't understand when you're in a non-union sort of scene or reality TV. They don't understand that um, it kind of cannot happen without you. Um, you know, I, 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 let me <laughs> three, four times, it cannot happen without you, without these positions. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but that's interesting. I thought that it would be producers guild, but it's direct. It's the DGA UPMs are under the DGA. Yes. Interesting. Um, and then you talked about line producer. So line mm-hmm. producer hires the UPM. Of course, this is f- the beautiful thing about Megan. Why I was excited to have her is she working on stuff with money. Let's be clear. Like, <laughs> yes. These are budgets, right? Um, so they have, you know, they have the budget. But so what does the line producer do when those two roles are are separate? The separated. Um, so the line, the line producer um, would come in and either take a budget that was already created or create a budget for the production. Um, and that person is an above the line position, um, that, um, works alongside the creative producers to make sure that the, we have the funds to make the product, to make the show, to make the movie. Um, and so, um, A line producer also typically would have knowledge of unions. Um, They would have knowledge of what it takes labor wise to create this and also the gear. Um, They also know a lot about post-production and finishing so um, that they can bring it to fruition and also say, oh, you really don't have enough money or you have enough money. Um, most, most of they say you don't have enough, have money. enough money. Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. And, and so if you don't have enough money, um, the LP, um, line, line producer, I say is the expectation manager to the creative vision. Oh, nice. That's yeah. I, I've, I've always thought of them and, and this short changes everything they do. I always think of a line producer as an accountant, a create, but one who's creative, who knows the industry, like you said, knows the standards for what things cost. Um, mm-hmm. And so th- this is a great opportunity to say I get a lot of a lot of my mentees want to be mm-hmm. w- want to like make their first film or make a short and 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 I always ask them what's your budget and they're like I don't know how do I know and I'm like find a line producer and by the way there are black women line producers mm-hmm. one of the reasons why we want to make it on right. <laughs> is uh, they exist um, and and that is a person who knows what things cost. They know what, what locations can cost, right? Like mm-hmm. to do your, to shoot it in Los Angeles versus shooting it in, in uh, New Mexico, right? Wherever mm-hmm. you're gonna be filming it. And then they know the costs of the actors. They know they have all of that information. And I love that you talked about the potential for sometimes the UPM, the unit production manager, is is also the line producer. It could be one mm-hmm. person on one production. And in that case, that person would see it all the way through. The, like you mm-hmm. said, the UPM, usually the job finishes after filming, mm-hmm. whereas the line producer is on still all the way through because they're still helping you with the budget for editing, which is such an important part of the process. And I say that because my husband's an editor. So I always say they, they're the most important people after the UPMs and the <laughs> after the Megans. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay. So my goodness, I have so many <laughs> questions. I, I'm going to, we'll, we'll cut this part out because um, Farida has also made us some great questions. So I'm going to pull okay. up another one of hers. So 
Um, you also have your own production company, Hudson Fillmore. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about your company? I know that you've done a film recently. Uh, so tell us about the company and also your film, Domestication. <laughs> that <laughs> one. Oh, <laughs> so I, I, I love it too. I cannot believe that um, the um, woman that I follow in that documentary, um, she just put us into some film festivals recently and um, we, I met a distributor. And when I made that, it was not supposed to be on a big screen. And basically um, Kim came to me, Kim Yi, who is a woman um, just, I, I can't even say all the things that she does. She's an artist. She's um, a feminist who was raised after the third wave of feminism. So it just, it just is, she just is who she is, even though she does go by all pronouns. Um, she was getting married and she married an ex-client and okay. she, so but you, let's talk about client of, uh -huh, of her. She, she's a dominatrix. So one of her clients, hence, hence the domestication, right? yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and so she basically, cause she knew that I worked in reality TV through some artist friends of mine. And um, I told her, I, yeah, I had, I've done many weddings on TV and um, she wanted me to direct and produce basically a bridezilla. She thought she could do a bridezilla, but as I got to know her, I realized the conflict was in her a lot mm. uh, around a lot of her, uh, first generation trauma, she, Chinese American. She came here when she was about five and her parents got divorced at that time and how that affected who she was. Um, and she kind of rebelled against the quote unquote good Chinese girl. And she did everything in opposition of that. And, um, and also, and when I say opposition, meaning that standard of perfection, that um, I've learned that a lot of mainland China parents try to put in their parent um, in there in their children. And um, so the documentary talks about that and what I found through the journey of that documentary, um, because it could it was not a Brazilis that that just wouldn't work um, because she chose the perfect partner for her. So her rebelling against her parents gave her parents so much joy to have her do a very traditional thing, marrying um, you know, for all into the first, a cis white man, it just seemed, you know, but behind the scenes, you know, like when they got married, she had a key to his chastity belt. So, um, you know, and like the parents were all there at the wedding. This, 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 this was open. It was, it wasn't hidden, you know, and, and the doc is not about her sex work. It's about her journey as a woman still keeping her power while marrying the love of her life. So, um, yeah, it was, um, very unexpected, um, that it turned out that way. Um, and we start shooting that in 2019. Um, they now have a child, um, wow. you know, part two, so, so yeah. part two is coming. <laughs> well, we're, 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 we're definitely going to work. Um, I have found a lot of challenges, um, which I haven't got to discuss with you, um, for us to screen it with me being a, um, black woman. It was hard for me to get it into festivals because it's a Chinese American story. Okay. I thought it was the sex work, but when I would talk to these festival um, people, they would say it's because we want to showcase movies made by Asian people. Okay. And I'm like, but Kim is a producer, you know? And so, but it was, it was, it was very difficult. And I was only able to get it in one festival without okay. pulling strings. I do have friends that could pull strings, but um, I also am very aware of taking space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'm saying? Because there are black females directors that are killing it. And the Asian space in the United States is just, it can't even compare, you know, to what black. So I was very, you know, aware of that. And I didn't want to take too much space up um, or try to get rules bent, but it does hurt me because that, that particular documentary when um, immigrant children, Asian people see it, their response is like, oh my God, you told my story. And they don't even think about the sex work, which is the most amazing part about the documentary. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, right. So, so sorry. I know I talked, talked a little about for a while, but. 
No, I'm glad uh, because uh, the, it actually I was leading up to another question and that perfectly led me up. But I, I also want to mention that we'll include the trailer in our newsletter. We'll include it on our website as well. It really it looks very powerful and like a story that needs to be told. Um, mm -hmm. But Megan, to that point, even when I was reading your, you know, t uh, looking at your bio, um, mm -hmm. you are a you your work is intersectional. Mm -hmm. You are a black woman. And, and is yeah, you said she, her pronouns. Okay. So you, mm -hmm. you are a black woman, but so much of your work also looks at other identities. You talked mm -hmm. about womanist, you talked uh, queer identity and also a the Asian community. Mm -hmm. um, what drives you in that way? And how, do you see the industry being behind in that? trying to catch up to that how are you seeing the industry um respond to your intersectional lens it's very i think the industry at the top levels i don't think truly understand but i think that there's enough people that have said things where um have pointed out um the disadvantages that the industry has caused, that now we're at a point where um, working for Paramount, which also has CBS, and I um, think you remember the article, um, I think it's CBS has an inclusion problem or diversity problem. I, I I'm not, may, not, may not be saying it exactly, but part of our company goals are inclusion. So if I say something to this effect, um, we all have to be in the office for a certain amount of time, but people who have children get to leave for their children's events. I think the single people without children or married people without children should be able to leave too for events for their life. That was taken a lot better, me saying it now under the guise of mm. inclusion, intersectionality now than I think if I would have worked at a place and not, and not just saying Paramount, but if I would worked at a place years, years ago. So just on those working models. When you um, say years ago, I'm like, if it had just been prior to George Floyd's. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let's be and, real. Let's be real. That's when everything like suddenly. And, and now we on that other curve going down a little bit. I find I, I'm finding that, right. There was a big push and we push for a lot of things and we got a lot of things, but now we're back on that. No, we're focusing on this. Um, so I, yeah, when, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have said it four years ago, probably, yeah. you know, I, I, I think in, in, in my skin, I might not have been able to, I probably would have had to write, write it anonymously, but mm -hmm. I think with me too and women, then George Floyd together, mm -hmm. I'm able to say, that, I, you know, because I didn't understand the gravity of Me Too, because I was not, um, I'm grateful that I was not a victim. I also think I was not mm. seen as sexual. I was much heavier in weight. Another reason why intersectional stories matter a lot for me. Um, I, I um, So Hollywood, it is, it is interesting. I don't think it's going completely away for Black people, but it will change. Other groups, I'm very interested to see how it moves forward. Like I saw how bros was received, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you know what I mean? So I'm, I, I'm, I'm trying to find those. I'm also seeing what's going to happen in independent cinema. And um, I, um, we're in the finishing stages of a project. Um, I, I believe you were connected to the climate summit um, with Sean Dasani for agents of change. I'm a yes. producer. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a producer on that movie. Yes. And, <laughs> and I kept telling him, I was like, I'm gonna be speaking with Fanch and I want our poster to be done. <laughs> Will you yes, go please ahead. tell Sean Dasani that I owe, <laughs> uh, owe him an email and to please forgive me and I will get back. We'll cut that out too, but, but <laughs> yes. not, the part, not the part about the, um, the doc. So is this a doc feature? Oh, it is. It is. It is. It's not a doc. It's actually a scripted, um, spy, um short that um sean wants to make a feature out of so we're trying to get it in people's faces that um 
are interested in um, climate stories and we just have spies going around the world. Now we decided to hire a um, majority all trans cast and we have a trans director, yes. but that, that is yes. just, that's just because we could. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not because we had to, or the story involves trans people. And that's what I think is, is, is lovely and beautiful. Cause like when they, they approached me to help them with the project, I said, I'm just bisexual. Is that okay? <laughs> they, they were like, oh no, we're not just looking for people. I said, cause I was just looking at everybody's backgrounds. And so um, I was able to do help them produce that at the beginning of the year. And now we're at the finishing stages. Right. And so when you ask about what Hudson Fillmore is going, um, my, um, my goal this year is I will be, um, there's two scripted um, shorts that I will finish outside of my day job projects. Um, next year I'll be directing my own narrative, sh um, short and 23, I'm really looking for financiers so that in whatever happens in 2024, um, I am looking to, um, become a seller again, a product full, you know, yes. full time. That's my, that's, that's my aim. That's my goal. Um, I love making content. Um, but right now I'm getting to, you know, I'm producing a movie with Will Packer. Um, I just did a Christmas movie with Idris Elba's company, Green Door, and, you know, at work. And um, those kind of connections are what I'm learning because for various reasons, it was hard for me to break in um, the industry as a line producer. And speaking of George Floyd, it was George Floyd that the doors just came down. They were like, oh, we need you. We need you. We need you now. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I had all this knowledge and didn't get properly paid for it. And now I can get paid for it. And I'm hoping to go back out there, use all this knowledge that I have with the connections that I've made to make the type of stories that I want that um, people who don't typically get a voice, I would like to give them a voice because that's what movies did for me Growing up, I would get to hear stories um, and see certain nuggets of life that I just didn't know existed. And um, so that's that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. And, and that, the activism, the storytelling, the skills that I have, um, that's what Hudson Fillmore is. So. I got chills. You know that you know that's what True Jalo is all about. So you know mm -hmm. we're we'll doing some co-pros. Plus, yes, our yes, producer yes. Mimi, when 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 you said Idris Elba, her eyes lit up. Hopefully, her <laughs> husband Chris will not be listening to this episode. Cause what? Um, amazing, Megan. Oh, this mm -hmm. this is this is beautiful. Um, I'm so excited and, and our, our episodes will be dropping in January, February. So we'll have awesome. time to put the po poster up, okay. um, for the sh you know, yes, for, for all your projects and, and we will be shouting you out and supporting you. Are you comfortable talking about salary ranges? Cause that's yes. something we, we ask our guests to do so that our listeners really have a sense of we, we want y'all sisters listening mm -hmm. to know this is something you can do. As Megan said, she saw that scene, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, watching the credits, which I love, by the way. <laughs> First of all, we should say to everybody, stay for the credits, not, not only to give, you know, to give gratitude to the people who worked hard on it, whose names you should know, right? Like you just, you don't know those names and you should because they've worked the hardest on the on the things you're seeing. The celebrities were hanging out in their trailers most of the time. Always stay for the credits, both to you know give give that love to to those who did the work, but also to learn what people's roles are. What are mm -hmm. all the roles available to you? So um, on that note, Megan, can you talk about credit ranges, sal uh, sorry, salary ranges for UPMs, for line producers, for you as an independent producer? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, it is, it's very interesting when you do talk about salary um, and for me, what I, what I've learned and it's been hard being, um, as marginalized as I've been in society to actually fight for getting a rate. So what I would ask anyone when you're looking for a job, talk to your white male counterparts. 
about what what would you get the, the in nice this? ones the anti-racist uh yeah, yeah. patriarchal <laughs> yes and well you know and, and and even even if the patriarchal ones are willing to help you true those the, you, uh-huh and because as as a line producer i learned that no matter what it was the white cis men that always said i want more they yeah. always did and that is something we all should do so when it comes to UPMs, there are um, there are rate sheets that you can go on the DGA website and see what region you are in to see the scale, the basic level um, of of what of what you should get, and that right there can help you. Um, what what I like, um, and it depends on if it's a UPM gig for a year, what sort of support staff you have, because there are some UPM jobs where you're actually the LP as well um L LP rates um LP is for, line producer yes <laughs> <laughs> those 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 rates should definitely be around between five to four thousand a week starting depending on how much it is and depending on the type of production um that it will be because if there is a documentary for example where um, you're following a civil rights activist and it's not, um, you know, it may be grant funded, but you're only working on that one day a week max, you would lower your rate. But if it's a full-time job four four to five, um, for a freelance gig seems very, very reasonable for, for that knowledge. Um, and, um, but for your actual salaries that you're going, even for independent productions that are non-union still use that scale rate sheet, because what I find in non-union productions, you still have to do the same duties, even a little more difficult because you have to fight for a union format on a show so that you stay within budget. You know, you, you, okay. you, you stay within, um, parity for your crew okay. which is a lot of time you you know you have to but those those scale um sheets are out there all over the place they normally change around february of the next year entertainment partners um they have a guidebook um and it costs like 22 dollars that that you can get that can just give you those rates so even if you're not a line producer a upm you can look at a first ad rate second ad Produ um, production designer on down. You can just look across the board and get get those numbers for yourselves. But I also would implore you to talk because when I I want to be an SVP um, of production for someone like um, you know Charles Charles, Charles D King yes like or you yes yes <laughs> and, and, you know and, 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 exactly and so what what I have found for those um, companies um, three hundred thousand is the lowest when I talk to yep. my white counterparts, but when I also talk to sisters, my um, Latina sisters, that's not what we're getting paid. They're not getting that. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I, I have I have not gotten to meet yet the Asian women in my group and, you know, that, um, but I, 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 you know, so when I see that, I'm like, oh, and then I also, I have some male mentors that I have that I talk to and say, I'm going up for this. How much should I get? Um, right. Also, a, another thing with rates too, which makes it um, um, helpful, especially if you're a UPM and LP right now, um, they're kind of um, at a shortage. So you can use Staff Me Up to get another um, job offer. Um, I did that actually with Paramount. I got another job offer. So I use that so that they would yeah. raise me up. And I learned that, uh huh. And I learned that from my white male counterparts. So, so I don't want to limit anyone, especially in this, this age that they understand. Um, I think Trevor Noah said it best. Listen to us, listen to us. Ooh, sure did. You know what I mean? And, and I'm sure summarizing did. the beautiful things that he say, but I mean, there's just so many, um, nuggets we that we have over after evidence, after evidence, but from voting <laughs> to running the, the industry, right? listen to black women like mm -hmm. that it's just um yes 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 oh see this is the problem because i want to go on for an hour okay okay uh, uh i'm gonna i'm gonna have three more questions mimi i promise three more questions um so first question what are the skills needed to become so when they like when when your um mentors recognize that you were a producer outside of the kind of 
of course, the kind of creative, the networking, the, those things. But what mm -hmm. are the kind of like hard skills you need to become a UPM? I think you need to be very observational. You also have to, your ego has to hit the, the road. So if you're a person who needs ego, you need um, like ego um, inflation. This is not the position. Mm. Um, but you do need to be able to look at the project from every angle so that you can understand what a real complaint is versus just the creative or head of department asking for more because every department always asks for more. Yeah. Um, so when you can do that, um, that really helps also someone that I, that one of the things I like, and I think that I'm a decent UPM is I worked my way up. So I got to see different positions yes. and I get to understand, um, where they're coming from. You know, I worked in accounting, I worked in, um, the art department. Um, I, um, learned gear very well in, re in reality TV. So I understand what it takes for camera gear to be secured properly. Um, the, what, what the electricians are up against, you know, the grips are so that I can explain to the creatives, you have a scene that is going to, to actually shoot it is going to take an X number of setups. We don't have the money or the time. So how do we accomplish this without? And that, that is a skill set you get from being observational. Um, the other thing is that I've had to learn is to, I'm not a schmoozer. <laughs> I'm not a schmoozer at all. I can um, help you with that one. I, <laughs> I love you it. Might, you might have guessed. I can <laughs> you can't. We're, we're, we're definitely going to have to talk. Because I always okay. said, if I, ever, if, I, if I ever ran a company, I would not be the one to, because um, if you say that to a creative, they're like, oh my God, she's trying to change my vision. I'm not. So what, what I've had to learn, mm -hmm. and I have done um, therapy courses about how to um, lessen my bluntness, if that, if that makes any sense, to have nuance to who I say I cannot do this to um, and say, how about doing it like this? Or is there another way we could get this done? So you UPMs being very unaware of who they're speaking to. Ooh. Yeah. And having that sort of tact, because you could have someone, a creative, just totally blow you up. Oh, she says no. Um, and so that is one of the, one, one of the main skill sets to be self-aware and realize that our main skill of seeing problems head on, trying to stop them happening, we cannot articulate that back to our creative counterparts majority of the time. Yeah. Um and let's see. Um, it's so interesting. A lot of my job deals with numbers. I'm not great with numbers. Even though okay. I went to math and science school, you yes. do not have to be great with numbers, but you do have to learn how to look at numbers comprehensively. So um, if you can look at a graph see, you know, just any, any, any sort or COVID, this is perfect because all of us have looked, looked at these COVID graphs over and over. If you can look at the COVID graphs and you can see when it might not be the best time for you to interact with someone who has immune system problems, then you can be a UPM because you will be able to look at a budget, look at a budget tracker, look at a cost report um, or hot cost and be able to assist the greater whole with that information. You have other, other technicians, other um, wonderful skilled people who can help you with the numbers, can help you calculate. And there's so much software out there today, you know, too. Um, so that's, right. that's, that's what I found. But those, those are the things. And um, I try to treat people like, not that I'm their mother, but I um, do approach people as, as a UPM and it helps me not um, to stay approachable. If I do treat them with love and nurturing care, even if I don't have the time. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or you don't like them. Or you don't oh. like them. Well, Fanchon, I don't really like anyone, but that's not, you know, but, but I, I, I think, you know what I mean? Uh, but, 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 but I, I think that's because I'm a true introvert. 
and I love my time to recharge. But when I in, when I engage with people, I do, and like I love one on ones with people. But when you have 160 people all day long, even if it's my best friend, I need a minute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Okay, we see we gonna wrap this up because okay. I know you go you gonna spend the rest of the day laughing and in your house quiet. Um, okay, I said three questions. Here's the second to last question: How, where can we find you? Where can our listeners find you and support your work? Um, well, I have a website that I created, meganfilmore.com. And um, I have a wonderful woman named Portia who helps me outside of my day job, just keep it up. And we're about to do a revamp of it to just to just add some of the new things that have happened. So that is a great place. I also um, have my um, Instagram, which has a lot of my stuff outside of work, like my activism work, not only um, the projects that I do in work and and personally at um, feeling more of Meg, which is a play, play on play on the spelling of my name, feeling, F E E L I N G, um, more, M O R E, of M A E G. Sounds like a lot now, but once you see it, and my name is Ma Megan Fillmore because I always have to spell it for everyone. All three of my names, I have to yeah. spell them. So when, when 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 you see it, you'll you'll understand. <laughs> and and it is a wonderful account to follow because you'll be all over the world. First of all. <laughs> And it's intersectional. I have to go back to that. I love mm -hmm. that, you know, I find we get siloed and and, and that was on purpose, right? We've been mm -hmm. intentionally siloed. So like black folks stick, stick with black folks, right? And and to see that you, I, I hope your film plays in AAPI festivals mm -hmm. and in black festivals and in just people festivals, right? Like, because you are an example of what we need to do, which is ultimately if we band together, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that's how we get to liberation, right? We can't do that in our silos. So I love that about your work and about following all that you're doing. Okay, final question. <laughs> so Megan, you are sitting down to a lovely sister brunch with mm -hmm. young Megan. Okay. And we wanna know what are you both eating? What are you drinking? And what do you tell young Megan? When I think of young Megan, I'm gonna think of Megan with relaxed hair at like the age of like 10 to 11. Um, and I mean, I was like five, four. So <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I was pretty, I was very similar. And um, she was having either high C or Tahitian treat, which is very popular in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And she had a little bit of vegetables on her plate, but she had some sort of fried pork and um, bread of some sort. Very, very Midwestern meal. Um, myself these days, um, I do not eat um, meat. Um, I'm a vegetarian and I def desperately try to stay away from dairy um at all costs eggs may come in but i really try to stay away from dairy and hope to be vegan one day um and i love me some mocktails um ritual has come out with a great um zero alcohol um line of beverages and they have a great gin so i love a good Ooh. gin gin and tonic with lime it's so so lovely um and i love 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 um these uh, mock like mocktail oxtails that I found at this place called Div Divine Plant Based Cuisine mm. in Georgia, Ooh. and it, it's lovely. So I would have me a full on Jamaican vegan meal yes. sitting 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 with young Megan, and I basically would tell her um, the importance of exercise so that you can do all that your um, all that your heart desires, and to be yourself. I hid from myself for years, you know, and um, I think being myself um, is really important and say, it's okay. You're actually not that dark skin. I always thought I was super dark. I thought I was super overweight. I was never super anything. I was just always making. Like, I was like, <laughs> super, super woman. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I have to sleep and rest. But let me but I'm sure that 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 will be my sister brunch with that little Megan in Columbus, Ohio, and you know, and tell her that even though it feels like no one is in your corner, I had a death in my family this um in I should say in my family of friends back in Ohio. Mm-hmm. And we all came together. And even though I'm bisexual, um, I have secular religious views, which are very different than my friends back home. I also do have a very diverse group of loved ones that I call family. Um, which all of my black girlfriends came to me and they're very religious and they, they supported me. And, um, you know, um, I, I don't want to discount my white best friend, Chelsea, because she, she was there too. She's always rolled, rolled with me, but it was just such a lovely group. And they said, Megan, we always support everything you do out there. You know, we know it has to be hard that you were the only one who left, you know, to come this far, you know. And um, so I would just tell that little girl who always thought she didn't have people in her corner and that she was so different because, you know, I always had an Asian friend or Yugoslavian friend. And they would be like, you think you're white and you think you I am Megan Latrice Fillmore. That's it. And I want everyone else to be able to be the Mimi, the Fanshin, the the of of who they are. It's so important. So um, you know, and that's that that's what and I also would show her my birthday my birthday photo shoot. I took a shoot in I all gold that. glitter. <laughs> and I and I and I and I in, in all gold glitter because I've gained a little weight um this past year and I said but this is still my body and I still get to do all these wonderful things and so um I would just show that little girl those pictures and um just say this is what you have to look forward to so (laughs) Megan thank you so much for coming on Sister Brunch we appreciate you so much Uh, we can't wait to share this with our listeners you're inspiring you're out there hire her if she available Um, (laughs) and thank you truly thank you well thank you I feel honored to be amongst so many wonderful women um because still I still have that imposter syndrome like am I allowed to be this cool I mean this great and I'm like I guess I am (laughs) you are (laughs) 